welcome to the second part of today's program, where we are absolutely thrilled to have Lucy Bailey as our guest. Ms. Bailey is one of the most exciting directors working in the UK today, having done her fair share of Shakespearean productions at both the Globe Theatre in London and the RSC in Stratford. She read English literature at Oxford, where, as a student, she famously convinced the very reclusive Samuel Beckett to allow her to stage a production of his text, Lessness, reimagined as a theater piece. This courage and creativity led Miss Bailey to first work as assistant director to many important um, directors, uh, notably Peter Hall at the National Theater. She then went on to direct operas at Glenbourne Opera, and we have Mark Rylands, then artistic director at the Globe Theatre, to thank for Miss Bailey's forays back into straight theatre and into Shakespeare when he invited her to direct her full-length production there. Not quite Shakespeare yet, it was uh, Beaumont and Fletcher's The Maze Tragedy. So, uh, she has since directed several Shakespearean plays for the Globe, perhaps most notoriously the production of Titus Andronicus that was famous for its unique body count of audience members who fainted during performances. She has also directed several Shakespearean plays for the Royal Shakespeare Company, and she returns to the Globe soon with a production of Much Ado About Nothing opening this April. Joining me in interviewing Ms. Bailey is again, Professor Michael Dobson, who has told me that he has known Lucy for over 40 years. Okay. So I am assuming they know each other from Oxford and would perhaps be an interesting interlocutor, privy to information and insight only possible from friends of such long standing. Thank you, um, Lucy, for being here and taking time out from what can only be a you know grueling schedule. You're just weeks out from opening a new play. And I, what's, you know, is this your first lockdown performance? Um, what's that been like going back to live theater? Please tell me because I, 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 I'm raring to do the same thing. Is it like riding a bicycle? Well, it, 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 it is in a way, except that the bicycle has got very rusty and, <laughs> and, <isn't in> the <laughs> pedal. <laughs> and perhaps there isn't the road that you normally go on to get the bike to actually move along it. So, yeah, it's I think I think theatre's really suffering from kind of birth pangs, <laughs> you know, trying to get born again. It's a very, very difficult process in, in London right now. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. Anyway, um, the first question I wanted to ask you, I'm Judy, by the way. Um, <laughs> not that I, or, this or, is or, Yeah, uh, though you can call her Miss Ick. Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> is, I mean, this is, the, this is the first time, I mean, what a treat. This is the first time I've ever heard Lucy called Miss Bailey. That's uh, absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Michael, piece of don't blow my cover. I'm trying to be formal here. You know, there's an audience of 200 people who actually think I'm, you know, an academic. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think academics are invested in pretending that Lucy is a 12 year old dressed as Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. This is the first time I've met. Her, so now I'm calling her Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Um, <laughs> First thing I want to hear from you is this. Um, can you talk a bit about how the English major becomes a theater director? Because I read somewhere that you were an English literature major. Yeah. I can understand how the English literature major, say me, becomes an actor. Because, you know, you always imagine you're that person when you're reading a book. But how do you become, where's the leap to director from English well, that's literature? A, that's a, such a big question, really. I mean, I think you, you become a theatre director probably because you know you want to be a theatre director that's how I did I mean I, I, I knew at 17 you know I wanted to be a theatre wow. director I knew nothing about theatre but I just knew enough to try and find a play when I got to Oxford and put it on and I think I put on a terrible play by Yates the only jealousy of Ema nobody should try and stage that play it's unstageable but I decided to enter it into a competition because I've been told that if you want to be a theatre director enter it into this competition and I did win that competition but really the only competition I've ever won and uh, that gave me the confidence to go on to the next really stageable play which was by Picasso, Desire Caught by the Tail, which is again <laughs> not <laughs> If you want to become a theatre director, don't direct Picasso's plays. He was a beautiful painter but not a playwright um, and that was in a way though that led me to uh, being in touch with Samuel Beckett because I was on a kind of experimental thing. I thought I was the avant-garde as we all do when we're that age. Uh, so the, the, the fact that I was studying literature in a sense just helped and went alongside this clear ambition or clear desire 
to direct plays. It was it was somehow not necessarily entirely connected. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I mean, I, I just find it fascinating that you just know you want to direct plays. At 17, were you like innately bossy or <laughs> what? <laughs> Did you want people doing things for you? <laughs> I was actually I was actually a musician, and I this is a sort of old story that I, I tell. That is, I was sent by my music teacher to um, uh, an opera house to be a switchboard to, to be a telephonist uh, when I was seventeen, and so I spent this kind of year, a bit like the film Cinema Paradiso. You know, I I absolutely fell in love with the opera at that point. I mean, I was besotted with it, and I spent all my hours. I wasn't answering the telephone, watching the process of staging these pieces and watching, of course, Sir Peter Hall at that point, uh, you know, going up to these singers and whispering in their ears and then the singers would move in a different way. And I was thinking, what's he saying to them? And why is, why is what he's saying to them making a difference to this storytelling? And that was basically the seed for me, not, not, not necessarily from studying literature, but from just watching someone move somebody about on a stage. But of course, Studying literature at Oxford was also a help. My professor was was the person who introduced me to Samuel Beckett, so I feel very very privileged to have had that had that possibility. Yeah, and, and do you think that literary baggage has its advantages, disadvantages now? Or yes. Now at yes. Oxford, we were we were taught, in, I think, in a terrible way. We weren't taught at all, and it was uh, Michael might back me up on this, but it it wasn't really seen to have much advantage to learn anything about the context of the literature. So we sort of were, were studying, studying pieces of prose and poetry, but without any understanding of why and why they were written and the world from which they were written. So my whole journey since Oxford has been to really endorse the, the act of pursuing why this piece of literature exists and what was the society that kind of produced it. Um, so in a way, Oxford sort of, you'd have thought would have given me those tools, but it, it didn't. And, and if yeah. I was to do it again, I would be begging to, to study history, history of art, alongside literature and alongside yeah. drama. <laughs> that would be yeah. my ideal. Yeah, I mean, in a way, Judy referring to us as former literature majors is misleading in the English system because you only get one subject. You're taught practically nothing um, yeah. about, about anything else. And, and one of the dominant paradigms for many people then was still new criticism where you just do close readings and you respect the integrity of the text and you might be allowed to talk about the influence of different writers on other writers or which bits Eliot which other texts T.S. Eliot had cut up to, to put into the wasteland um yeah I mean Lucy went to a particular college Oxford's a very disparate institution some tutors do some things and some some do others I suppose, I mean, I may have been a bit luckier. I learned quite a lot about 19th century context. Um, and and I, I remember going and buying myself, you know, facsimiles of quartos and, and winning a book prize and spending it on a facsimile of the first folio. I was quite interested in Shakespeare's context, but there was nothing connecting that with our world. There was nothing about what Shakespeare doing at the moment. Um, you know, I was saying earlier, I spent an awful lot of time going off and seeing performances of Shakespeare, but there was nowhere to write about them within the system. We were supposed to just, you know, deal with the poetry as as poetry. Yeah, um, and, and, and you that's know, what as, was I suppose, yeah, doing Shakespeare is very, very different from studying Shakespeare. I mean, yeah. that, I mean, you know. Lu Lucy arrived at Oxford and she already had this idea that putting on plays involved logistics and a budget and, and you know, kind of project management, which, you know, never occurred to me. Right. You know, I, th I thought you just turned up at an audition. In this department. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyway, OK, I, I, I mean, I was just very interested about that. And um, well, this might be related to what you said earlier, Lucy, because of course, I could ask you, so why do Shakespeare that? But that would be too obvious a question. Maybe when? When do you do Shakespeare? When do you feel prepared to take him on? Or is there that kind of trepidation? I'm not sure. I mean, you did Beckett to the first go, but you know, did you feel that you couldn't do it just yet? Um, I don't think the choice was, I don't think there was a sense of choice. I think you just went from 
pillar to post trying to get a little foot through the door. You know, when you're first getting to London, I knew nothing about London. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to assist Peter at the Nationals. That was my first job as a second assistant. And then later, I was lucky enough again to get an assistant job at the Royal Shakespeare Company. I, can't, I wish I could say I went to the Royal Shakespeare Company because I was passionate about Shakespeare, but I probably went to the Royal Shakespeare Company because it was one hell of a great job to get. You know, only two people were given this job and you were there for two years. So in a way, my, my real Shakespeare training, I suppose, began at when I was 26, 25, 26 at the Royal Shakespeare Company, uh, but through, through no real prowess of my own, <laughs> apart from the fact I got, I got given the job. I do, I do wonder about that sometimes. You know, what, 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 how, was my, how was I qualified? I think I was so ditzy and really unfocused, but it did, um, it, it did open up a world for me. And I'd come from quite sort of avant-garde music theatre and I hadn't come from really a text driven world apart from when I was at Oxford. So for that last few years, I've been doing quite sh wonderful and strange and eclectic work, um, but, but mainly working with high end of contemporary music. So to go to something like Shakespeare was a completely different move. And in fact, I came out of the Shakespeare Company and went straight back into opera and avant-garde music theatre. So it took me a long time to reach this moment where Mark Rylance took me into the globe at the beginning of the globe's uh, hi uh, history. And uh, that's when I really made these discoveries. And that's because I was given the chance to work on these texts. And it was only by actually working with actors and, and uh, uh, this sort of alive interaction with the text that I suddenly, it sort of blew my world. I realized that if I was, if I had a choice, I could own, I would want to only work on Shakespeare for the rest of my life. That was a kind of discovery. It was massive for me. Of course, you then can't. <laughs> the world is pragmatic and you have to earn money and, and people don't keep employing you. They kick you out or they go on to the next person. You know, it's, it's more difficult. Um, but I was very lucky in, in meeting Mark because working at the Globe meant that I suddenly didn't have to work. At, you know, before in opera, I'd been working massively visually and my main partner was with the designer. And it's like a marriage. And really the whole engine of your work comes from the world you create with your designer. And suddenly working at the Globe, that was replaced by working with actors just on just them with me in a room. And it's a very different thing. And I realized suddenly that I could and I wanted to work with the physical creature. I wanted to understand more about us as human beings uh, and this world of the actor where they really research and look into the psychology of their characters. Again, it just moved me on as a person and as a director. Uh, well, I guess it also mattered when you were at the Globe, because I mean, my sense of your work is that it's really very sort of edgy and, you know, and that's why I love it, you know, uh, plays with body counts in the audience that that I can that I can watch. Right. Um, but then that, from what I know of the Globe, you know, having seen occasionally things were there occasionally, not any of yours, sadly. Um, sometimes the Globe can be too traditional and boring. Can I say that? <laughs> Um, because they, you know, they they ha they have this sense of authenticity that makes the play kind of like boring, and then they have like this really edgy stuff. And I mean, you know, I I guess you were lucky again to sort of be there when the right artistic directors were there. I guess. Yeah, but I I really kicked against uh, all this sense of uh, what is authenticity. You know, that this is a very big discussion actually because. Actually, understanding authenticity, of course, releases you and is, is really informative. Um, but a certain kind of authenticity, and this again is something I'm sure Michael will bring up, you know, it's really, it's, it, it then just suffocates and stops progress. So, but actually understanding uh, the Elizabethan world and also the roots of that theatre in medieval theatre actually gives you some keys to unlocking how to work in that space. So I had a very big argument, and it's an interesting one, with Mark, um, because as soon as I was in the Globe, I saw it as a site-specific space, and I saw it as a whole theater in the round. And I saw it as one step from the medieval morality plays that really were performed off carts and were taken and processed along the street. Now that's exciting. So the audience walk with these carts and listen to these plays on these small platforms which are moving, which means that there's a sort of interaction between the shifting audience and the telling of a story. And I thought, oh my goodness, the globe has just stabilized that idea. It's just put this, it's just put these wooden planks in a massive 
crowd, just as if it's just off the street, but they've formalized it in a building. But if we're going to get to the excitement of what would have been the globe then, you've got to find ways of interacting with that standing audience. So my first attempts were immediately to bring the the, or the actors off the stage. I mean, for As You Like It with Mark, Mark fought it hugely. I put steps, I was the first person to put steps all the way along the edge of the stage so the actors continually came down. The fight in As You Like It, the famous fight with Orlando and the wrestler Charles Absolutely. took place in the yard. So the audience were being pushed back and pushed over sometimes. It was a very visceral idea of theater. And that's what was edgy. But the reason it was edgy was because I, I think was because I'd understood something of the real spirit of yeah. the globe, which I wouldn't have accessed unless I did have a little bit of scholarship there and really bothered to look back in time. Do you see what I mean? So there's a yeah. way of using knowledge to be alive and interactive, and there's a way of using knowledge to stop choices. So I fought a lot with Mark over this. Uh, and eventually, to give him credit, he, he wrote me a little note about a year later and said that he had found something, Michael might know this, in scholarship that backed up this idea of steps coming down and the actors actually being able to interact with the crowd. But he, he had found it academically, but for me, I just knew it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you knew the, the space, you know. I, the space space I knew the theatre from before Shakespeare's time and I knew that it would still be absolutely living memory. That's, that's how you perform populist theatre. Right. And my, the, my the, 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 the reverence. Well, the reverence for Shakespeare comes after Shakespeare. So yeah, exactly. it would have been performed exactly. in the pit, right? With, yeah, the, yeah. with the prostitutes, you know, plying their trade and people selling nuts and oranges and stuff like that. Yes, Michael. I shouldn't be saying yeah. that Mark was trying to, I mean, Mark's one of the most the geniuses of theatre, as we know, and you'd, you'd cross London to see him, I don't know, pick his nose on that stage. <laughs> but, I mean, he was absolutely the most extraordinary performer. But when it came to a directorial muscle, he he resisted it sometimes through, again, a, a, a desire to keep true to something that I felt should only be questioned, you know, and only be yeah. turned upside down at all points. Yeah. No, you can only produce analogies of what was happening in 1599. You cannot replicate what was happening in 1599. You've got to get the spirit of it. You know, like, like is it Marlowe says, tradition is not the worship of ashes. It is the cherishing of flame. And, you know, there, there was a certain amount of worshipping ashes going on with all that talk about ooh, authentic goat hair in the plaster work. And you must only do things we think were done in 1596. You know, that that does produce very paranoid and anxious actors and, and, and very dull productions. I mean, I have to say, as a theatre historian, I think the costumes were too expensive in 1599 for any Elizabethan actor to have voluntarily got near that heavily armed audience. Um, unless the building was on fire. But Lucy's, of course, absolutely right about, about the energy of the pageant wagon and that sense that you know, these, these buildings were just a way of charging admission for something that used to happen in the streets on, on platforms on wheels. And I have vi vivid memories of platforms on wheels in Lucy's Titus Andronicus, where the tribunes were pushed around through the audience I mean, particularly vivid memories, because one of those platforms ran over my foot, as I recall. But uh, it was still um, a, a, an experience of theatre I would not trade. I, I'm, I'm incredibly glad I was there. Yeah. OK. Um, what do you think? OK, here's here's another question. I prepared a few, but here's one. What's the most common mistake in your experience um, of both actors or audiences when approaching Shakespeare? Or maybe you want the positive way of asking the question, like what's the sort of um, best thing a person can bring to when one approaches Shakespeare, especially for people who are afraid of it or, or think that you know Shakespeare is too difficult, Shakespeare's not for me. What does one bring to the table? Gosh, that's a really good question. I mean, it's again, a very layered question because as a director, you just, you just try and access what the story is and who these people are. So, so the best thing on one level is, is curiosity to find mm. out who, who these people are, why they behave in this way. It's like an anthropological process you know, <laughs> of uncovering this, this society, but also relating it to yourself. So part of it is curiosity. Um, 
Uh, what would you say, Michael? I don't, I don't really have a. I'm not. Sure, I'm not sure. I do. I mean, I prefer it if an audience isn't taking notes during yeah. a performance because they think they've got to pass a test afterwards. You know that yeah. that. I mean, if they're scribbling things down in the interval because they, they're frightened they might forget, then that's great. Or if they're doing sketches in the interval because they want to remember this you know, extraordinary moment, that that that's a different thing. Um, I do feel yeah, that I mean, I, the audiences come with expectations. I mean, I've been I've performed where some people in the audience are like mouthing lines together with you, yeah. and you just want to say, "Shut up." <laughs> We get that out. Stop. <laughs> you know, um, I, I guess when they come with these expectations of what Shakespeare ought to be, mm -hmm. which yes, I suppose, it, I suppose my it, thing is there's a sort of the, the worry I have is is a kind of tiredness now of 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 maybe too much a sort of saturation of Shakespeare, a bit like coming from the opera world where you know everyone does their Madam Butterflies endlessly or you know or Carmens, and you therefore start to go in order to see what has been done to Carmen as opposed to Carmen. Um, and I do feel there's a dilemma in Shakespeare productions now that we, we have this slight sense of overdoing them and having to do them again and again. And therefore we are trying to be fresh with them at, sometimes at the expense of them. But of course we don't want to either just be doing them in a sense, trying to preserve something either, that's silly. So we have to keep re-questioning them and re and re, re, reinvigorating them for now. But I do think that sometimes leads us into very strange places. And I think it may lead the audience too into strange places, having seen their 10th Much Ado. So in some ways, I would just love audiences who've never seen a Shakespeare. That would be one's ideal. Mm. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? <laughs> um, but you're in the middle of London, so I don't know. People go to London. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like a pilgrimage. Um, Let's see. Uh, but you do. I mean, I mean, I was reading about your work and you do tend to do sort of more obscure things or sort of radical stagings. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, is there such a thing to Lucy Bailey as the unstageable? Let's put the question that way. Unstageable. You mean a play that's unstageable? Yeah. Is there such a thing? Because it seems like, I mean, my God, you did call us. <laughs> Like, now, well, now, now you're telling me, Judy, that now, I, now I'm impressed with myself for doing coma. Because honestly, I would read it and I would despair. I couldn't understand it at all. I mean, it's really, really difficult and really dry. I really didn't like Milton at Oxford. That was the one time I remember yeah, just, yeah. I just abandoned anything to do with Milton. I couldn't bear him. So yeah. the fact yeah. I did coma is a real tribute to myself. Um, <laughs> but I also worked with a writer, Patrick Barlow. And we found a way into that piece. We found a modern frame, which again accessed it. Uh, so in a way, I fell in love with it massively once I'd understood how to enter that world. You know, again, just a, it's just a release of imagination, um, just through understanding and perseverance and tenacity. <laughs> and, then, and then you have to be very humble and realize that it's actually a really great piece. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'll have to see it because I, I can't imagine. I just can't. <laughs> But I'm no Milton fan either. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, so you don't think anything is unstageable? No, I, I don't suppose I really do. And it is your, it, you, you have got the possibility as a director, you know, to create the architecture of the piece of it, you know, to, to reinvent what it is that isn't working and, and make it work. Um, mm. So I, I, you know, that is, and I think I, coming from high end of music theatre, I think I always had that appetite to try and make something almost unstageable actually communicate something yeah. to an audience. In fact, I really fought for that. And in the end, I formed my own music theater company of musicians, simply so that I could be responsible for conveying music as stories that could be understood and, and making music really impact, you know, because I felt that these worlds of high art get very remote uh, from an audience, you know, and I think that's true of Shakespeare. I, I do the same thing. I want the story to really move you and and I want it to be totally visceral and understood uh, and the globe I why I get so attracted to the globe is because of that contact between actor and audience that just like Michael saying his he got his foot run over you know you the you can make these performances um such one-offs you really feel you're never you know that, that, that you you experience it uniquely uh, because it's such a live event 
Mm. Does that make Can sense? Can I ask a question? Oh, I do Can like challenges. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm, since the whole topic of this conference is sort of the relationship between academic knowledge and theatrical knowledge and, and how the two interact, I mean, you, know, you had this utterly useless literary education that didn't even help you enjoy Milton, which is shameful. Um, <laughs> but what, what kind of, if you could rewrite your education, so as you know, if you'd been deliberately trying to produce somebody capable of reimagining rather familiar, but amazingly strange plays and, and making great productions out of them, what sort of th things would you, would you now wish yourself to have had uh, during your education? Mm, I, think I, I think I mentioned it really, Michael, I think, but I may be wrong. I think I'd have preferred to have been taught sort of concrete things such as history and the history of art. Mm. I think I'd have felt more equipped. I'd even like to have been taught the classics. That would have been really interesting as, a, as an English scholar, you know, to have understood Homer and Virgil, Virgil um, Ovid, you know, all these great, what, what almost seems to underpin Shakespeare and underpin so many texts. Um, I think without that sounding very dry and academic, I think it actually would have been totally illuminating and um, mm. would have made certain drama like Milton become alive much more easily. And I could mm. have accessed that imaginative space more easily. I mean, I do mm. find this is an interesting topic with, with the interaction of academia and theatre, because I, I, seek, I seek people like Michael all the time. In fact, I think I go to, go to you, Michael, on almost every Shakespeare show, don't I, to say, please talk to me, because I yeah, find it's, it, it's, it, it, it's, it... It's absolutely lovely, and I'm always convinced that I'm of no help to you whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, my... my... My most, I mean, my, I, I, I always remember and cherish the memory of going to the cafe in the National Gallery to talk with you about Macbeth and you, to, and you talking to me about the ideas you were having and, and that you and uh, Bill were, were sort of evolving towards a design and me saying, oh, they'll never allow you to do that. You know, <laughs> and of course they did. And it was, it was stunning. This was a production in which Lucy said she wanted the globe to feel like hell, a kind of Scottish hell. Um, there was bagpipe music um, and Lucy saying that her image of hell was you know, Dante's Inferno and the sinners in the frozen lake were just their heads poking up and that she would produce this by having a black cloth stretched across the yard of the globe so that everybody standing would be standing with their heads poking up. Um, and the witches could get in underneath and run around among their ankles. Um, oh, and I say, come on, health and safety. You know, suppose there was a fire. You know, they, they'll never let you do that. Uh, and of course they did. And it was absolutely wonderful. You know, it was the most terrifying mise-en-scene. It really, you really were. You know, Macbeth was literally kind of on the edge of hell, which we were already in. It was most disconcerting and and really forced you to, to listen and, and you know, take seriously the, the religious dimension of that, of, that, of that play. But I mean, my contribution was apparently trying to persuade Lucy not to do it, <laughs> as I recall. I mean, I wrote a program note about something else, as I remember, but, but, but um, it, I don't it know. It sound know like that. Lucy takes no for an answer. I mean, that's sort no, of what I'm loving no, about no, her. I, nor, nor should she. Yeah, uh, but, but you know that, that that's absolutely not 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 her job. I mean, Timon. I do remember talking about Timon with you, and you being a bit anxious that after that in the second half there was just Timon, and and there wasn't anything very engaging going on, and there wasn't anything going on in his life except him gradually shuffling out of it. Um, and and I talked about well, maybe this is where he has a relationship with the audience that kind of takes over from his attempts at relationships with his with his uh, friends and creditors that that um which may or may not have been of any help but I mean, of course what people remember about that production is is the imagery of the crows you know the there were ropes stretched above the yard there were actors partly dressed as birds kind of hovering you know this sense of this sort of great time and as this kind of piece of carrion flesh that his creditors were want, wanting to eat 
I mean, it's a lot yeah. about eating in Lucy's shows. It's really interesting. What you said, Michael, you were the one who said that to me. You said it's a lot about feasting and food. And once you pointed that out, it was really clear. I mean, we'd already had, in a sense, this image of these predators, but then we mm. developed the image, the staging of a table. So yeah. that the, the globe became this round table, the stage, um, which, which, which came directly out of our conversation. Um, so I, I, I think there is this, 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 this thing called instinct, of course, you know, with, mm. with time and I instinctively knew with Bill, my designer, that the first image for me was Hitchcock's film, mm. The Birds. So I knew we had to somehow get this. And for Bill, the whole play then became about a vertical understanding of the globe space, just as in the way I did the same with Macbeth with Dante's mm. Hell. Mm. But what you're seeking when you talk to someone like Michael, who I talk to a lot, um, is you're seeking both an affirmation of your instincts. You want him to say something that goes, oh, I'm absolutely right. That's dead in the play and it's right in the play. And then you also want him to create some, a few, like open a few doors for you to walk through. And I think that's what I, I do that double act with, with Michael. I'm, I'm looking for him to say something that resonates because I, I know it. I know that's where I'm going, but I'm also looking for him to slightly surprise me by opening up a door that I hadn't thought of and taking me through it. And then I start to rediscover certain, or discover rather certain parts of the story and text that I hadn't thought about. It's really exciting. I, I sort of depend on it. Um, and as, then, as and then he writes I, the program notes and explains everything to the critics, right? That, that works. <laughs> no, but it's really important that bit too. <laughs> Yeah, the, the only point of program notes is so they can be transcribed into reviews by, by yeah. lazy critics. <laughs> it really is. You don't want the audience reading them. It'd be, be, you know, you want them to be watching the show. Exactly. You know, if, if, it depends, if it depends on them reading what it means, then, then it must have failed in some profound way. Um, what I've remembered one other way in which I was once useful, which was bringing my teenage daughters to see Beggar's Opera. Uh, that wonderful production, The Beggar's Opera, you did in Regent's Park, and you saying, well, I'm, I'm thinking of casting my McKeith as Petruchio. Um, yeah. you know, do, do, to, you know, come, come and tell me what you think. And, and my daughter's just said, I remember talking to you after the show, and my daughter's just saying, look, if he takes his shirt off a lot, like he did in this, it'll be great. You know, that was, and, and they were absolutely right. And he did yeah. take his shirt off quite a lot in Taming of the Shrew as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the best directions are the simplest and basic <laughs> ones, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's it's rock and roll, bare-chested actors. Hey, uh, <laughs> what's the most audacious thing you did, Lucy? In your, you know, in your estimation? Mm, well, in a funny way, I think I think Michael sort of said it. I think stretching an elastic, a black elastic sheet over an audience and, and asking mm -hmm. them to put their heads down and then to remain there for three hours. That was one of the most audacious things. And it, it was a kind of shockingly audacious thing. It's hard to explain how brave that was and that the audience went along with it, you know, even to the point that the porter would come out with a, with a bucket, which he'd just peed into. So he, so he would walk, yeah. and he'd come towards the audience and they're all stuck in this sheet with their heads there and they'd throw the bucket of pee over this audience who would then duck under so that, and then pop out again. It was absolutely mm. blissful. So that was very, brilliant. I think, I think, in, I think in a way that the, the globe has been for me the most experimental in that sense in the past. I don't, I hope I can do the same with Much Ado, but it's, it's a different play. So it's, it's allowed these very, very bold choices, whether it be with Titus, we put a kind of roof over the globe, a valerium, um, which again was funny because <laughs> We wanted to create our own lighting because you can't have electric lighting in the globe. So we wanted to sort of give ourselves chiaroscura, you know, sort of shade and light. So when the sun comes up in the globe and the audience gets a bit tired, instead you have this great big black canopy and the sun shone between these stretches of cloth. So we got this sort of streaks of sunlight and we put a lot of smoke in and incense. So we got an atmosphere, which is what's very difficult at the globe is to create atmosphere. But on the occasions that it rained, of course the rain would be collected in this black cloth. Yeah. And then you'd think, oh, I'm, how wonderful, I'm dry. And then the wind would come along and sweep it up and dump sort of bucketfuls <laughs> onto the audience. It's, uh, to make me laugh, but uh, the poor audience did suffer. Well, but yeah, I think the globe has been the some of the boldest work, along with perhaps the Tame of the Shrew. Mm. I also thought very bold where yeah. I turned the 
Shakespeare, uh, the Royal Shakespeare stage, the thrust stage into a massive bed. I mean, one big mattress. Uh, and, and then wonderfully so, it sort of had its pillows going up and it had then a sort of little piazza at the back. So you sort of combined the public and the private space, but it meant the whole play took place under uh, under the sheets and on the, on the bed, bouncing and under. And it, it told the story fantastically well yeah. uh, of yeah. this kind of battle of the sexes, um, both poetically oh. and viscerally. But it was it was a very, very bold statement, but it came out of the heart of the play. I do, I do sort of fight for that, that you don't just, you don't just come up with these things and plaster them on. Yes. You, you yeah. try and find out what essentially Shakespeare's talking about. Um, yeah. And then it will, it will then come to you in an image if you work long enough at it. <laughs> yeah. So the, yeah. the English major, right? The English major can explain anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. great no, it was, for explaining it anything. Was, <laughs> that was that was a wonderful show, and the, and the connection it drew between Christopher Sly going to sleep in the induction and the territorial dispute over the marital bed that's going on for Lucian, Lucentio and Bianca and, and Katerina and, and Patricia was just wonderful. And I'm very pleased that it coincided with me starting at the Institute because it meant that the first week I was in the job, I could get Lucy and her creative team in and we all just talked about Shrew. And uh, we had a PhD student at the time who was writing about the meaning of Elizabethan beds. Uh, so she got to write the program, which was terrific, you know, and, and you know, the, to kind of produce a historical gloss on this fabulous, incredibly simple piece of design that we were just looking at this huge bed. Um, well, and that I'm was, that was like the arena. You know? hmm? It's my understanding what the bed signified in Shakespeare's time. Uh, and, and how wealth was measured by having a bed um, mm. that, that for me unlocked the play. So it, it's, that's a real example of, of actually mm. expanding your knowledge of a period and it, and it managing to then take you through a, a doorway again in, into, into yeah. its world. Uh, yes, yeah. in, in, into an incredibly unpedantic production. I mean, it was in kind of vaguely 50s dress, sort of an yeah. Italian, kind of, kind of Italian world. Yeah. Sort of, it was sort of Italian, you know, new new wave cinema kind kind of world. It was a yeah. lovely show. Um, I mean, it's another thing to to say about Lucy's work that, unlike some directors I hear actors talk about, who are essentially kind of disapproving control freaks who who work by withholding approval, Lucy's method, as as I've seen it at work or glimpsed it at work, seems to be incredibly generous and enabling so that our actors have a lovely time and they all marry each other. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a remarkable demographic fact about Lucy's work. Yeah. The, the percentage of, of marriages that come out of Lucy's shows is absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, I, don't, God, I don't know whether Lucy healthy. has any explanation for that. It could very well be that, you know, the rehearsal process is long in a Shakespeare yeah. play. Oh, you know, I ended up, well, I met my husband long at enough. rehearsal. You know, <laughs> it's mm. because it's long. Yeah. 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 Um, no, but it does sound, it does sound, I, I mean, I, I do, I can see what Michael is saying because it does sound that Lucy sort of thrives on collaboration. She has lots mm. of enablers, you know, aside from Michael, there's your designers and your writers and people who kind of, you know, try and stop you, but then ultimately help you get these yeah. audacious, sort of ideas across and that sort of not only speaks of a very collaborative kind of director not the sort of godlike you know um that kind of control freak director we, we know the type um but it sounds like that's quite the opposite is that because you're a woman I mean am I allowed to ask a question like that do you think your gender placed into it or or is it just who you are well, I, I do think there's, I think there, there is an element of that. I do think women are fantastic collaborators. It's a big generalization, but I do mm. think, I mean, I think it's interesting in Shakespeare's plays, how you see them move from the male relationship to something more sophisticated and civilized through female mm. bonding, if you like. It's a very simplistic way of putting it, isn't it? But it, it's mm. true that in Shakespeare's plays, the, the female often offers that voice. Um, and I, I do think we do. I, I do think women are great negotiators. Uh, Anyone and, raising kids would know. <laughs> on the wrong right. side of that, I think we sometimes I have seek, two boys, I know. <laughs> yeah, I have two boys, but I think we all you know, seek- um, We can run the world, Lucy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think there's another side to that where I, I see women often 
needing confirmation and perhaps perhaps sometimes missing, which sounds ridiculous, you know, a sort of authority figure. Uh, and therefore that's where, the, that's where I, I, I hate sometimes my lack of confidence that I think does come from that kind of, so it has a, there's a double side to that seeking collaboration. You sometimes also don't trust your own, your own <laughs> sense of uh, your, own, your own ideas actually. So, so I do think I'm a good collaborator and I, and I have enormous amounts that I owe to my collaborators, including of course, to my designers mainly, and hugely lately my, my partner, Bill Dudley. Um, mm -hmm. But I've always worked so closely with designers all through my life and composers and writers, you know, and then actors. It's just, I mean, we're not, we're not a dictatorship. We're not pure artist directors. We're an applied artist. We only function in relationship to other people. Uh, so you have to have, I think, a, a sense of humility in that. Yeah. It can be forgotten, I think. Yes. Okay, that sounds fantastic. I just want to go uh, just a little bit because there's some people um, writing in questions um, from, from the audience. Um, Jonathan Chua, he's the Dean of Humanities at Ateneo, is asking, has Lucy's background in music informed the way she directs Shakespeare's plays? In what ways, if ever? Yeah, I, I, so it's such a lovely question. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think my background in music makes me look for musicality, if you like, look for opportunities for music uh, very easily and readily. And I, and I again value my relationship with composers because they can bring something to your plays that of course you can't bring yourself, but they also enlighten me as to how to manipulate space and time. Uh, so the sort of magic that music can do that you can't do in any other way, of course, does, does inform it. So yes is the answer. Um, I'm saying that, yeah, I think it, it totally does. I hope so anyway. Do you start um, with music? Because I've worked with directors who sometimes start with the music and make you yeah. listen to the piece and say, this is the scene. And of course you're trying to, you know, mm. uh, figure it out in your head. Are you that abstract or the music comes after? It really depends. It, it, it's so, I mean, of course, I, I remember Tame of the Shrew, um, watching the, the Godfather, the wedding mm. in that happens and the, and the, the band that follows uh, Michael uh, as he marries this beautiful girl and the simple village wedding and that totally informed the whole of the flavour and not that I just went into Godfather music but I understood suddenly the idea of these village, these peasants really, the, the people working off the land playing this music and it, that really helped. So yes I sometimes find it's a, it unlocks, it doesn't always come first though, you know sometimes I'm really fighting to, to hear the music and I really have to work hard to, to understand to understand where with the sound of what's going to go on but when I when I do get there it always feels an immense relief you know because I suddenly find the world becomes complete mm. okay all right uh, there are a couple of questions here too on the Q&A that are similar um uh, Holly Ellis writes I'm intrigued by how you come up with imagining the sets and designs and adaptations for your productions I wondered how you go about the process. Do you tend to always have a vision in mind or do your creator, or your creations evolve from watching other productions, from literary inspiration, from readings of the original text? Butch Pang asks a similar question. Um, could you please walk us through your creative process from the piece <laughs> until the day of the performance? I guess, I guess oh, people gosh. are in awe of how you get from this point to that. <laughs> Wow. We'll speak a little bit to that. <laughs> you know, um, the, I mean, you know, wrapping your putting your audience under a big black cloth is kind of like a big yeah. leap. So how yeah, do you get I mean, obviously these ideas don't just come from me. They come, I mean, that idea absolutely came from the designer. So it, it's um, but it comes from a it also comes from a dialogue uh about the world of the play. So I just to try and cut short that process, my I it's a mixture. I, I mean, obviously you, you, you read, you, you seek inspiration in other texts and talking to Michael, etc. You're looking for these moments of flashpoints, really. Um, and you're reading through the play time and time again to look for these flashpoint moments where you go, oh yes, get it. And when I get it, I start writing my own story of the play again. So I start storyboarding the play in my head because I've suddenly got a familiarity and I can feel the characters moving, if you, if you see what I mean. I can feel them functioning. But, but it also can happen as in Titus or, or Macbeth, that I just sit in a space and I'm trying to relate how I see this, the piece in that space. So it happens a lot for me at the Globe. I sit there a lot and then I go, I can feel that 
I'm at the bottom of something, which is hell, you know, and then Bill feeds me with this imagery from Dante and I go, oh my goodness, there it is. They are stuck at the bottom of hell. They're stuck in the ice. And I know that. And I also get a lot from the globe feeling like we're in a lock-in. I always start my piece, every Shakespeare piece. It's so boring. I always go, and now we are locked in. We're in a lockdown. We're locked in. <laughs> so I, mm -hmm. I would have this sense of the space shutting. And if we're shutting the doors, what, what's keeping us in this space? Is it, is it death? Is it seeing people torn apart? You know, a, a, a sort of voyeurism of death? Or is it love and sex and you know you know meeting your partners and what's holding us here and why are we being held to watch this piece so i i sort of i start from a mixture of impulses if if uh, it sounds so pretentious to me you never really think about it that's the point so when i'm talking about it it sounds pretentious but i think that's how and i think that's how we all we all start in from muddled there's no for me there's no real process it's a muddle and i muddle on sometimes in great despair you know, amount of times I've walked into an artistic director's office and said, I can't direct this and I'm, I'm giving up. <laughs> it's dreadful. I can't penetrate this text, Time in of Athens. You know, I couldn't understand it. So you, you keep muddling through until something, till these images come. But it also comes through hard work of, of looking at the text. And, yeah. and to what extent do you allow your actors to muddle through rehearsal? Yeah, do you I, have I, your sense of what they should be or are they discovering themselves in the process as well? A little bit of both. You have to you have to shortcut them. You have to give them shortcuts to the world that you have developed through this play. Otherwise, you'd spend eight weeks or six weeks or five weeks, whatever you have, um, trying to, you know, then telling them at the end of the process. Oh, by the way, this is how you're this is the world of the play. That would be ridiculous. So you, I always spend a lot of time at the beginning just through improvisation and through text work so that they start to own some of those parameters of this world, whether it be Italy in the 40s, uh, whether it be the Roman temple of Gadiator, temple of Titus, uh, or the medieval world of Timon and its birds, you know. You have mm -hmm. to make their imaginations alive to that because then they're going to bring things to the table which are useful and not unuseful. And you have to spend a lot of time as a director editing ideas to the useful ones without seeming to. Otherwise, you're just feeling like you're doing a series of cutoffs to somebody. So you have to keep giving them opportunities to give you stuff. But at the same time, you're trying to tune what they give you so that it's useful for the world that we're in. Does that make sense? Because that, that is yeah. exactly what, what you do for a rehearsal yeah. process. Yeah. And I, I, it got me thinking, so is there an advantage to having an academic as an actor or an English major as an actor? Or would the I, actress I, be too hard to tame because she'd have too many ideas of her own? And I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Only if it gets in the way of their instincts, you know. Only if it becomes something that, that stops them being able to connect up with the character. Um, if it's something that actually gives them different journeys with the character, then I think it's fantastic. And that sort of brilliant intelligence uh, can be wonderful as long as it is also emotional intelligence. Because obviously you're looking for actors to have emotional intelligence and not just intellectual intelligence but if the two go together then you're in heaven of course mm. um that makes sense doesn't it michael two more questions yeah, here, absolutely. It be similar, they're absolutely. Gonna ask. Hmm? michael i i oh I'm, yeah um i was gonna say something before i forgot what it was i got i got sorry interested. i keep jumping in i get so excited yeah but no one thing i was going to say is that some of you know, Lucy's sense that the actors have to think their way into the world of the production is is one of the reasons actors love working with Lucy, because I hear horror stories from actors in some other companies, which it, it, I'm not going to name just immediately, where they rehearse and they rehearse and they rehearse and they rehearse and they've got a, they've got a sense of who they're playing and what's happening between the characters. And then they're told at the tech rehearsal, oh, and by the way, you're all going to be dressed as playing cards. You know, and, and suddenly they then find themselves on the set and it has and, and it has nothing to do really with how they've been imagining the play. And, and it's something that was designed before the rehearsal process even began. And it just it's just kind of sprung on them. Um, and they have to kind of come up with some last minute compromise between what they thought they were doing and these bizarre outfits that they're being required to wear, whether they're Elizabethan ruffs or whether they're, you know, 
spiky rollerball outfits. You know, the, these things do happen, but but they don't, they don't happen in Lucy shows. No matter how inventive the design is, it is directly related to to the ways the ways the actors are moving and the ways they're they're responding to each other. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to put that on my bucket list now. I mean, I cannot go to London. I'm going to time my next trip to London mm -hmm. for a Lucy Bailey play. How's that? <laughs> because yeah. I have to see this. I have to, I mean, I was reading all about it leading up to this interview and I was just, you know, blown away. Um, this is the kind of work I'm personally very interested in. I'm, I'm not interested in stuffy Shakespeare or Shakespeare that only sort of stages the play rather than you sort of reimagines it it makes you see it like it's new and 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 the range of your body of work is amazing too i mean from opera to shakespeare and then you started a little small warehouse um intimate space theater which you know i love going to things like that they're sort of out of the way and and you do a lot of williams and pasolini and but, but obscure works of Williams and Mussolini. That's why I, I asked that question about the unstageable and yeah. how, yeah. That's very true, actually. I'd forgotten, in a sense, my, my work in, in the, just a small room, which was perhaps one of the best two years of work I think I did, mm -hmm. or three years. I just felt, I suppose, having done a lot of Shakespeare, this going to a room and allowing the audience just to sit in the room, we didn't really ever have formal Seating. Have you ever done Shakespeare in a room, in a small space? Oh, that's, that's a good question again. I, I, I haven't, and I would love to. I'd love to find out the difference. I mean, I, I really enjoy the sort of epic sort of muscle you have to have uh, in both the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Globe, but I've never, ever directed Shakespeare in an intimate surrounding, mm. and I think it would be revelatory. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, with less space, I wonder what you'd put the audience under, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay um let's see michael do you have further questions let me just check the oh well i mean i'm i'm dying of curiosity about much ado but i, I i'm yeah i know i wanted to ask that because you know, are we allowed <laughs> no I, you know, well, I'm, I'm wondering whether any... I, think it's, I think it's the hardest shakespeare i've ever ever done because i i i said to michael when i first read it i just said well where's the where's the poetic envelope you know i I've got no point of entry. There's no island with a sea. There's no wood to run into. There's no fairies. There's no, it's just a house and a garden and sort of domestic. Mm -hmm. It's almost sort of novelistic, the play. It's 70% uh, prose. It's, I've never mm -hmm. met anything like it in the Shakespeare canon. And I, mm -hmm. I still struggle. I'm still struggling. I, I'm getting there. I, I hope I'm going to do something which, which, which reveals the play, you know. Uh, I, I, I am. I can't tell you how difficult this one has been. <laughs> so um, let's see. We've also got smaller companies now at the Globe. I think that's sort of COVID, post-COVID, and that's also a big challenge to try and tell the story with quite a small group of people. Yeah. Because in a way, the Globe, you know, you need a lot of people to tell that story in that space just to have a kind of impact on, on that sea of audience. Um, mm. But yeah, so it's 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 not a straightforward play. Very un uneven in its tone. It doesn't know whether it's a tragedy or a comedy and it looks but it has these seeds which is very much what Michael was pointing out to me it has these seeds which you see him developing like the Leontes or Othello or in later plays um uh Edmund John is the Algo. yeah they all become these fantastic characters later uh, and you can see them planted here in much ado and done much more crudely but that has that's made me very curious about these moments in the play that have bigger potential so I'm I'm hoping that I'm going to sort of pull something out of the play uh, that that isn't quite there, that is sort of more allegorical and 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 perhaps a bit more magical. Um, mm. It's going to be a bit of an experiment. I, I'm very, I am excited, uh, and I'm not. I'm not putting the roof on the globe. I'm not got a black cloth, and I haven't got birds. But um, mm. I'm hoping that there is going to be a certain kind of interaction with the audience, a very different kind. I assume that your nostrils are cleaner now than they've ever been before. I mean, you must be having lateral flow tests, you and all the cast continually. I'm wondering whether, whether we'll see anything in the production that reflects the fact that this will be a show produced by people who've spent a lot of time having sticks pushed up their noses. 
whether that makes you feel differently about human interaction or not. We're not in rehearsal yet, so I'm hoping by rehearsal that we'll, mm -hmm. we won't be lateral flow testing. God, if we still are, that would be very hard and we'll all be so tired. But I it's think twice a day at the RSC at the moment, I tell you, twice a day. Wow. Are you see? Yeah. Awful. It's yeah. Awful. It's a, yep. Well, you're still first world. You actually have tests. <laughs> See, we don't have access. So the government just stopped counting. Um, it's a different <laughs> condition. You just felt lucky, that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but we're nowhere near opening theaters just yet. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to hear about um, you're about to open and you're in rehearsal and, you know, and I, you know, I'm with such envy, I listened to that. I just wanted to ask a quick question. Is there a Shakespeare play that you haven't done that you really want to do? Yes, I say it quite sort of naively because I, the last time I read it or saw it was years and years ago. So don't ask me what it's about, but I do want to do The Tempest, which is happening just after Much Ado. But it's always mm -hmm. been, if you ask me what was would be next on my list, <laughs> that sounds terrible. Because but, there's an island and, you know, spirits and so yeah. there's the way in. <laughs> way in exactly <laughs> no, it's, it's, now i see that i'd love to see what the sort of the lucy bailey imagination does to a play as as large as the tempest yeah um, uh, yeah <laughs> we'll that's worth flying to london for if mm -hmm. it happens <laughs> anyway um yeah uh lucy it was lovely meeting you and thank you for coming um, and thank you Michael for facilitating this interview of introducing Lucy and Lucy's work to especially oh. the Filipino audience so I'm now who are now like I guess with their mouths open and agog at the kind of kinds of things that can happen I saw questions in the chat about where can we watch Lucy's plays and my answer is Globe Player. <laughs> you have to subscribe. There are bits on YouTube, but not, the access is you. You have to subscribe, right? And it's still not the same as as live um, theater. No. You don't anyway, get your foot run over. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't get your foot run over on YouTube. It's not the same at all. No fun. No fun at all. Anyway, thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you for coming, and and thank you, Michael, for facilitating this interview. Um...